Hello, everyone. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Collective Bargaining for Data. I'll turn it over to Matt to begin our session. My name is Matt Pruitt. I'm the president of Radical Exchange Foundation. And uh, in this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about the idea of collective bargaining for data. The background to this presentation is that um, last year, uh, over the course of a number of months, um, a, um, a great team led by Radical Exchange Foundation, and in including many others, such as uh, Kalia Young and Shiv Malik, uh, Nils Gilman, Jennifer, Rohn, Jennifer Marone, myself, uh, put together a piece of work uh, called the Data Freedom Act, which is basically a proposal for um, overhauling the the way that the data economy functions and is regulated. Um, and I've given some other presentations where I go into a bit more detail about uh, what that um, what that white paper and what that proposal um, uh, suggests. But today I want to talk a little bit more about the motivations behind it, the background idea behind it, uh, which is essentially the idea that in order for a data, data economy to function well, um, collective bargaining needs to be involved. Uh, I think that this is not obvious um, and it's important to um, uh, talk about some of the insights that um, that lead to it. So um, let me speak personally for just a moment here. So I, before I worked for Radical Exchange Foundation, I was an antitrust lawyer and consumer lawyer um, and a, a technologist, among other things. And I think that if you really look uh, at the arc of my, of my career, uh, even going back to like childhood, the thing that I have been consistently concerned with is the ways that people exert power over each other. Uh, and in particular, the sort of um, subtle, hard to notice ways that, um, that institutions sometimes enable some people to have undue power um, over other people. I think that the... Um, the way that the economy currently deals with data is one of these kinds of situations. It's one of these kinds of situations where our institutions are a poor fit for what's going on, and it's enabling um, a lucky few to, um, uh, to concentrate uh, power and, and resources at the expense of, of a great many people. Um, the, uh, basic mechanism of this is labor exploitation. So labor exploitation obviously is not something new. Uh, it's been going on for centuries and it's taken many different forms. Uh, the first thing I, about labor exploitation that I want to point out is that if you look at the great fortunes made throughout history, a lot of them have had something to do with some people taking advantage of the relative powerlessness of others in order to appropriate their, their time, their sweat, their creativity, whatever it may be. So the first example here, we have the pyramids of Giza, um, of course, which were built by slaves. Uh, the second example is a, um, a medieval uh, palace, uh, which it, it signifies the, the, the feudal era in which landowners were able to exploit the, um, um, the, the serfs who were bound to the land. Uh, the next photo is Monticello, which was built by Thomas Jefferson using slave labor and who, of course, accumulated his fortune through the exploitation of enslaved people. And the, the next photo is a, um, a, a gilded era uh, mansion built, uh, I, I believe, for uh, a member of the, of the Vanderbilt family, uh, which recalls the, 
the fact that many of the of the of the fortunes of the industrial revolution, of course, relied on um, on various forms of of labor ex exploitation. This next photo shows the value that um, has been has has accrued in the uh, in in the in the Nasdaq index um, over the last twenty years or so. And the accompanying photo shows the skyline of San Francisco, where, of course, uh, so many uh, enormous fortunes have been made uh, over the past decade. Um, and I think that it's time that we uh, take a bit of a closer look about what's going on in, in this particular sector of the economy. So uh, to get a grip on the idea of labor exploitation, I'm going to go through a few uh, varieties of uh, sort of a taxonomy of different ways that labor exploitation can occur. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about its causes, uh, how it how it transpires, and and um, uh, why why it goes that way. I'm going to talk about solutions, things that have worked in the past to um, to alleviate or eliminate um, labor exploitation type situations. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, pass to the idea of collective bargaining for data. So looking at the different forms of labor exploitation, uh, the first form that I want to draw your attention to is forced labor exploitation. This is, in co of course, things like enslavement and, um, and, and serfdom. So in other words, uh, one kind of labor exploitation is literally using coercive force to, uh, you know, at, at the threat of violence and, and death, um, uh, force other people to, um, to work for you and, uh, and take the fruits of their labor. Another form of uh, labor exploitation is wage labor exploitation. Uh, so when we think of wage, wage labor exploitation, we might think of uh, images like this, um, women in, in textile factories, men in coal mines, uh, people in oppressive relationships with their employers, making low wages, working long hours, dangerous conditions, um, and, uh, you know, in many cases, um, being unable to, unable to advance or unable to, um, to negotiate a, a fair portion of the, of the value they're creating. Another important category, and in, in fact, maybe the most important category for this particular conversation, is informal labor exploitation. So what I have in mind here are um, things like domestic work, things that have traditionally been considered women's work, uh, child rearing, um, uh, cleaning, uh, maintaining households, things like that, things that have at times not been considered labor, but, um, uh, but have nonetheless been a, um, a, a, a channel for some people to, um, to enjoy an enormous amount of work, enormous amount of value creation without, um, without compensating the, um, the, the people who are, who are doing the, the work. Um, another important kind of, um, uh, facet of, of informal labor exploitation is uh, uh, the labor exploitation that occurs against the backdrop of, of um, uh, immigration situations um, and, and things like that, where there's some kind of an undue uh, uh, power imbalance. I think that the, the main point uh, of highlighting informal labor exploitation is just to notice that labor exploitation doesn't always take the form that we have in mind. So we might be thinking of, uh, of forced labor exploitation, uh, and if that's what we have in mind, we might miss that labor, is, uh, labor exploitation is going on in, in, uh, in the context of workers who are earning a wage in the Industrial Revolution. We might think of wage labor exploitation, and that might cause us to miss 
that labor exploitation is going on in, in domestic situations um, or, or other kinds of informal work situations, um, including, for example, uh, gig work today. And with that in mind, I want to draw your attention to the value that is being created um, in, the, in the data economy. So if you look at the largest corporations in the world, you can see that most of them uh, are companies that um, whose work depends on data, whose, uh, you know, whose uh, largest or some of their largest assets anyway are, are, are data sets or their access to, um, to gather information from people who are using their, their services in exchange for free services or, or subsidized services or whatever it may be. So the, the point here is to notice that, um, that if indeed data labor exploitation is a site of labor exploitation that we should be concerned about, it's not a small problem. It's not a small uh, thing that goes on here or there. It may just be um, a kind of a central plank of the contemporary economy and one that figures to become even more important uh, as um, things like machine learning and, and artificial intelligence um, improve in, in, in terms of the value that they're able to, to uh, output. Because of course, these things depend upon um, the data of, of the kind that I'm talking about. So um, to develop this point that, um, that labor exploitation is not always obvious, that it sometimes kind of hides in institutional forms that, that don't fit the mold we have in mind, I want to focus for a moment on the example of land. So this, uh, this sign was a sign put up by a, uh, a, a Georgist, which is to say a, um, an adherent of the uh, economic theories of, of, of Henry George at some point in the late 19th century, uh, pointing out um, something that, that, that Henry George, but, but in fact many others besides Henry George, have, um, have astutely noticed, which is that the value in uh, land, but in particular in, uh, in land in high density places, does not really derive from the labor of the owners of the land. If you own a, uh, a piece of vacant land in a city and the, uh, the, the people around that land, the, the, the residents, the artists, the, the shopkeepers, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, service industry, the, 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 the culture around that vacant land develops, then the value of that vacant land will increase and make you, the owner, rich, even though you really have done nothing except um, prevent anyone from enjoying that land. So uh, what, what land enables you people to do is, is to um, essentially benefit from the uh, value of the networks that are ha uh, t taking, um, that are operating around the land, the e economic and cultural networks op operating around the land. Um, and this is, uh, this is another kind of um, non-obvious way that, um, or I should say this is, this is one very important, very old, and yet quite non-obvious way that poorly designed institutions enable some people to, um, to benefit from the labor of other people in a way that, um, that is unfair and that you know, demands um, institutional reform. So one way of, of noticing this kind of hard to notice um, labor exploitation is just to look at an asset and kind of ask yourself, whose amazing work is it? that makes this asset so desirable. And in the case of the owners of, of real estate, you can see that it's not only the owner. It may be that the owner has invested in the land and built a building on top of it, but that's not the only uh, component of the value of a piece of real estate. 
in many cases, the most valuable thing about a piece of real estate is the land underneath the building. And the value of that land owes nothing to the labor of its owner. Uh, so it, as a general matter, when we are looking for labor exploitation in, in hiding in our institutions, this is the kind of thing we need to be attentive to. We need to be attentive to the kind of situation where somebody owns something, but it was really the work of other people that made that thing um, useful or valuable or desirable. So why, uh, why does this kind of situation arise? I think it's useful to, um, to look at, 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 at two uh, dynamics which are really common in, in all these forms of labor exploitation. So one thing you often see is unjust legal ownership privileges. Um, another thing that you often see is um, what I'm calling somewhat clumsily uh, divide and conquer social power advantages. Um, so let's see how these, how these things map onto the forms of labor exploitation that, that I'm talking about. So in the case of forced labor exploitation, first you can see unjust legal ownership privileges very, very obviously, right? You have um, the institution of slavery, the institution of serfdom, um, and somewhat relatedly, the institution of, of land ownership. These are all institutions that uh, um, come from an era of raw, direct, violent uh, oppression and exploitation. And um, you know, to whatever extent they are encoded in the in the legal system, you've got an injustice. You've got a, a legally sanctioned injustice. Uh, in these kinds of situations, you actually have no, no negotiation at all. Um, although, uh, it, it is, it's obviously worth noting that, um, that sometimes these kinds of institutions still persist through divide and conquer social power advantages, such as, um, racism, classism, other kinds of, uh, of systems by which um, a, a majority, or it doesn't even need to be a majority, just a, 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 a powerful clique of people is able to um, organize uh, to divide and, and oppress uh, people in another, in another class, in another race, in another segment of society. In wage labor exploitation, um, Again, we see these two kinds of components. We see um, unjust legal ownership privileges in the um, in the contracts themselves. So, uh, a con an, an interest in a contract is a is a form of property interest. And in the case of uh, industrial wage labor exploitation, you of course had um, uh, contracts that were. Uh, negotiated under under totally unequal information situations, totally unequal power situations, um, and um, incorporated all kinds of of, of oppressive um, uh, um, elements. Uh, similarly, you have uh, the 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 idea of. Uh, divide and conquer social power advantages. And what I have in mind here is you have the sort of the concentrated power of the, uh, of the, of the industrialist, of the company, um, and you have the divided uh, power of the individual laborers who uh, need, who are, are in a situation where they have to negotiate with the, with the company or, or with the industrialist, obviously usually doing so under heavy economic pressure or, uh, or without a full understanding of, of what, they're, what they're agreeing to, which results in an oppressive contract giving the, uh, the company an, an unfair uh, ownership interest. In informal labor exploitation, you see the same thing. Uh, in this case, we see unjust legal ownership privileges uh, embedded in like things like the institution of marriage which has roots in, in a, a property concepts, 
and of course is particularly uh, problematic where um, uh, where d divorce is difficult to obtain. Um, and you see similar kinds of, of structures in the in the immigration system where you know one party is negotiating with another party um, uh, where uh, under coercive situation because one party is depending on the other party not to report them to immigration or something like that. So it, in, in those kinds of, uh, of situations, you have unjust contracts. Um, and, uh, and then you also have the same element uh, that you would, um, you, you would note in, um, uh, in, in wage labor exploitation, which is to say um, divided individuals negotiating as individuals with um, uh, with larger uh, parties. Uh, looking at history, uh, you also can see pretty clear patterns in how uh, labor exploitation is is, is alleviated. Um, and it's it's fairly straightforward. It's basically things get better when you can eliminate unjust legal ownership privileges, and when you can address divide and conquer social power dynamics. And the key way that that has been done throughout history is through um, the mechanism of collective bargaining. All these different forms of it, we need to think about how to get rid of the unjust legal ownership privilege and how to address the divide and conquer bargaining situation. In the case of forced labor exploitation, Obviously, uh, for, this, for anything to get better, we need to get rid of the unjust institutions of slavery, serfdom, whatever it may be, um, just to make the possibility of any kind of fair arrangement thinkable. In the case of wage labor exploitation, again, it's the same thing. So first, we need to address the unjust legal ownership privilege, then we need to address the divide and conquer bargaining situation. The unjust ownership privilege in this case is addressed through things like um, uh, um, banning child labor, uh, regulating the, the, the kinds of things that can be agreed to in, in, uh, in, in labor contracts, um, courts not enforcing uh, what are called unconscionable contracts, um, so in other, in other words, um, uh, taking away the ability of, uh, of the, the powerful party to have an ownership interest that's, that's based on, um, on a, a coercive injustice. Second, addressing the divide and conquer bargaining situation, the way that this has been dealt with in the case of wage... Uh, wage labor exploitation is through collective bargaining, which is to say unions. Um, that is what has made a difference. That is what has improved the lot of, uh, of exploited uh, workers since the, uh, since the Industrial Revolution. In the case of informal labor exploitation, again, we do address the, uh, the unjust institutions, which is to say reforming marriage law, making it possible for people to get out of, uh, of exploitive marriages, reforming immigration law so that contracts aren't formed under coercive situations where, where one party is threatening the other with, uh, with deportation or imprisonment effectively. And um, on the divide and conquer bargaining side, again, collective bargaining. There's all this amazing work that's being done um, out there today by, by many people, including members of the radical exchange community, on organizing um, uh, collective bargaining for domestic workers, uh, gig workers, and uh, any number of other, um, of other uh, laborers who are, um, uh, who are not getting their fair share of the value that they're, they're creating. So how does this map on to data? So again, um, 
carrying carrying the theme over from informal data labor exploit from uh, from informal uh, labor exploitation. I, I want to point out that the 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 laborers who are being exploited in the data economy may not fit the mold that we have in our mind. So if you if, if your mental picture of labor exploitation is forced labor and you see wage laborers, you might miss it. If your mental picture is wage laborers and you see informal laborers being exploited, you might miss it. Data labor exploitation is like that. We need to we need to um, you know not allow rigid definitions in our mind that cause us to miss a massive um, uh, exclusion of a large amount of labor and a large number of people from participation in the uh, in the value that they're creating. So with data, we can ask the same question. We can say, whose amazing work is it that makes this asset so desirable, and uh, are they the ones getting rich? In this case, uh, you know, the people getting rich in the data economy are the shareholders of, uh, of companies that are, 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 are either directly in that space or adjacent to that space. Um, the data laborers are the billions of users of uh, digital services that are um, hoovering up um, massive amounts of information from them, making inferences between them, and so on. Um, it is, it's through this contribution of data. It is by allowing these, these eyes into our private lives and into our online and offline behavior that we are all able to contribute to these assets that are generating um, so much value. And, um, you know, but only the, only the few of us who have the right uh, stock options or the right uh, stock portfolio are really uh, fully, fully benefiting from, uh, from what's happening here. Now, this is based upon, in my view, uh, an unjust ownership privilege in data. And so I want uh, this. This parallels the kinds of unjust ownership privileges in uh, in contracts, or in, um, in in human beings, or in uh, in marriages that uh, that I, I've referenced in the historical, or not necessarily historical, but other forms of labor exploitation. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about why um, ownership of data can be uh, can be such a problem. So we generally think of our data as, as uh, individual assets as depicted in this, in this um, graphic. So I've got my data set, you've got your data set, my friend's got his data set, that's it. Um, the problem is that that is, is a truly uh, unrealistic understanding of, of what data is. Almost all data is overlapping and socially generated. So in my data set, I have things like uh, text conversations with, with friends, photos of me and you know, standing with other people, um, um, uh, genetic information that includes, uh, that, that, that reveals information about me, but also reveals tremendous amounts of information about um, uh, members of my family. Um, data is not created in a vacuum. It's created through social processes. This really, um, it, it's important to see just how deep this reaches. It's not just a few examples of a couple, you know, some special cases of where data overlaps. It almost always overlaps. Even if you think about something like, uh, if you think about, um, something like your Netflix movie watching history. You might think that's just your preferences. That's, uh, that's just reflecting what movies you've watched um, and doesn't have anything to do with anybody else. But that's not true. It's likely to be very closely correlated to um, what movies your friends have liked. It's also likely to be highly predictive about what movies your friends will like. The reason for that is that you are 
in a social context. Your friends have helped shape your movie preferences. So when you reveal your movie preferences to Netflix, you're not just revealing something about yourself. You're revealing something about other people that you associate with. And there's therefore something a little bit questionable about the idea that you have absolute title, absolute ability to convey to Netflix that information about all the people around you. So just put a pin in that. Um, and, um, uh, and then before we consider the following problem, which is a slightly different problem. So data is socially generated. Nonetheless, if you just think about the data that you control, when you go to a, um, to a platform uh, that is offering you services for data, you're not even able to uh, negotiate with the full amount of data that, that is in your, your data set. You're, you're only able to negotiate with basically some unique part of it because much of it can be obtained uh, elsewhere. So if, if I, if I uh, take my text conversation with my friend, that text conversation may not be of any value at all to a, a platform that I'm negotiating with because they may already have that same text conversation from, from my friend. So um, we're all, you know, be, we're all in this, you know, divided and conquered situation where we're, we're, we're bargaining individually and are, are unable to, um, um, uh, unable to avoid a, a, a distorted um, bargaining outcome. Making matters worse, it's important to observe that the most valuable data of all is, um, is data at the center of the Venn diagram, as it were, which is to say uh, data sets um, that uh, that have been compiled by combining the data of many, many people. Those are the data sets that uh, are most valuable. Those are the data sets that have the most kind of predictive value, the most um, uh, the most versatility, the most ability to be adapted to to new purposes and to um, and to generate economic value. So, and, and, and those, you know, there's always just a, there's a, just a natural advantage um, of, uh, to scale in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of getting access to that kind of data. We're always going to be uh, at a disadvantage to the players that are able to aggregate the largest amounts of data. And the players that are able to aggregate the largest amounts of data are always going to be able to extract the, um, the deepest, richest value from, um, from our data. Um, another way of thinking about what's going on here is basically that they, um, they can know more about you than you know about yourself, uh, or, or their data about you contains more information about you than your data about you because it also incorporates uh, information from other people in your social network that, um, that reveals things about you. So like domestic workers, data laborers are informal. It isn't what we first think of when we picture labor, but um, you know, again, if we get hung up on a certain picture of what labor looks like, uh, it causes us to ignore new forms of exploitation. Uh, it's happened many times before in history, and I fear that it is happening again now. Uh, it's, it's, it's of the utmost importance that we think of what we are doing when we contribute information to platforms as labor um, just to unlock the possibility that we will um, decide to, to, to try to, um, to, to get our fair, our, our, our fair share of the value that we're helping to create. Similarly, like industrial laborers, the consent of data laborers is secured through contracts that are agreed to under unequal conditions. 
or an unfair bargaining situations. You can just think of things like the, um, the, the, the checkbox that you click, the term of service that you don't read, the privacy policy that you don't read. Um, all of this is, um, is giving, uh, giving counterparties uh, title to your data, ownership over your data that uh, truly um, uh, wasn't earned in a, a level bargaining situation. And, um, and again, this divide and conquer uh, dynamic is occurring because we are all going to the data marketplace thinking of ourselves as individuals instead of thinking of ourselves as communities. If we start to develop an idea of what we're doing as we engage with, engage with the digital world and go about our lives and, and, pr and produce data streams, if we start to think of what we're doing as um, um, as collectively producing something of value, um, it may uh, it may help in terms of, of alerting us to the possibility of uh, of enjoying more of the value. Um, before I conclude, I I, I do want to make the uh, make a, a quick point, which is that. I know that uh, that this talk of of negotiation and and, and value, uh, frankly, rubs a lot of people the wrong way, and seems like the wrong way of thinking about what's going on with um, uh, with, with with exploitation and with the data economy. Um, I I want to just say that basically I'm sympathetic. Um, I, I'm very sympathetic to that um, to, to that perspective. Um, but the, but there are basically two ways that I respond to it. One is that we can't ignore the importance of, of, of money. M money, uh, money is a form of power. Um, and it, money is the primary form of power. Uh, I, I, I would argue that is being generated by the, uh, by the data economy. Uh, it's really important that we get large numbers of people um, a share of, of, of that. Uh, second, uh, and um, even more importantly, I want to point out that collective bargaining isn't just about money. So all of the forms of collective bargaining that have, have happened in the past have not have done a lot more than just increasing wages. They have increased uh, the quality of working conditions safety, um, uh, uh, control over schedule, all these kinds of things. And it's just the same with data. So financial interests are not the only interest that collective bargaining uh, can and should, and I hope will vindicate. Um, the um, co collective bargaining for data would, would help vindicate, in addition to financial interest, Things like our ability to control what is done with our data, control where it goes downstream, and also to um, uh, to help to help preserve uh, our, our privacy. Um, I also want to point out that in the in the Data Freedom Act, one of the central provisions of that act is, uh, or of the you know the the kind of putative legislation that we've sketched. One of the central provisions is um, is that it would forbid the absolute permanent um, alienation of, um, of data by collective bargaining entities. So uh, in other words, it, what, it, what it does is it, 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 it helps individuals assign their data to entities that become their collective bargaining representatives, and it stops those collective bargaining representatives from uh, selling that data into the marketplace. If, if they can sell the data into the marketplace again, then we essentially reproduce all of the problems that, um, that we're trying to address by getting the data into a collective bargaining architecture in the first place. So this is, um, this is really a, a fundamental reimagination of how data would flow through the economy and how the, uh, how the value of data would, would flow through the economy. It's not a 
uh, sort of uh, crass monetization thing intended to uh, intended to get more people to uh, e exploit their their data um, in, in, in a uh, in a deeper or, or, or more commercial way. That's just not what it's about at all. It's about re uh, restructuring power. So uh, with all that said, um, uh, I hope I've, uh, I've persuaded you at least to think a little bit more about the, the possibility that, uh, that the future of the digital economy really depends on um, uh, collective models of data ownership and, uh, and collective bargaining. And if you want to learn more, uh, check out the Data Freedom Act. Um, it's posted at the uh, at, at the URL you see there. Um, and uh, with that, thanks for uh, thanks for watching this presentation. And um, uh, don't hesitate to to reach out to me uh, personally uh, for any reason if you're interested in uh, in, in in chatting or or um, or working together. And um, I hope you enjoy. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the uh, Radical Exchange conference. Thanks. Hello. Okay, great. So I've got eight minutes um, and I'll go through a few questions here. So the first question is, um, how does this intersect with the idea of data colonialism? So I think that what I'm saying about data is closely related to the idea of data colonialism and some of the, uh, the ideas that, that um, Ulysses and, and Nick were speaking about earlier today, if you heard that talk. Um, I think, uh, so in other, in other words, I, I pretty much completely share, um, share those, those kinds of concerns about this uh, sort of appropriation of, of, of human life. Um, where do I differ with them? Uh, though I think is maybe a more interesting question. And the, I think the answer is that I worry about commodification in a slightly different way than, uh, than Ulysses and Nick do. Uh, for example, I, I'm, I, I, depending on the situation, sometimes I worry about commodification, sometimes I worry about not commodifying something. So a, a good example of that is like the institution of, uh, of, marriage or like like the informal work that happens in the context of oppressive institutional relationships. So I think that if you've got a, um, if you have sort of a felicitous network of institutional relationships, then introducing um, commodification can disturb that balance. But if you have oppressive institutional relationships, um, introducing commodification can um, can be be protective for example by um, like like there's nothing uh, I don't really see commodification in, in the way that um, that men have uh, oppressed women through informal relationships over the centuries I don't really see any commodification there but then if you introduce um, if you introduce something like, um, like, like common property law in in the context of divorce, where you do you are commodifying the, the product of the marriage and introducing like a monetary relationship. There, it actually um, 
uh, it, it improves the situation of informal exploitation. So I think I just uh, sometimes have sort of a different view of that sort of thing. Um, uh, labor unions, next question. So labor unions were crushed in the US uh, largely by government policies. How do we avoid this with data unions? I think labor unions uh, were enabled in the first place by government. I, I think that, you know, co collective bargaining um, kind, of only, it kind of only happens in the context of, uh, of collective bargaining being enabled by some larger power structure. I mean, if you, if you just have uh, uh, completely formless power relations, then um, uh, I, I think it, it almost always collapses into a situation where collective bargaining is, um, is impossible. So what happened in the United States was, was the United States government dismantling the frameworks that it had earlier set up to make collective bargaining possible. Um, how do you distinguish, next question from Fork, um, how do you distinguish good unions from bad unions, as well as labor unions, consider police unions and lawyers unions or parliaments? Um, the question of police unions is, uh, is, a, is a very interesting one. Um, the, um, uh, I think what's going on there is that, uh, I mean, th so th just to be, just to be clear, police unions are clearly a misfiring of collective bargaining that, I mean, that is definitely an example of, of collective bargaining, um, going wrong, but I think that it's, I think that it's fairly, uh, clear why right the, the the whole point of collective bargaining is to um is to protect people from uh coercive power relationships and so a a police union bargaining to protect itself from accountability for its direct application of uh or for you know to protect its members from accountability for their direct application of state force against others is just a complete perversion. It's like that shouldn't be on the table. You know, the the idea of a of a union protecting its members from accountability for directly using violence against other people. You know, it shouldn't be on the bargaining table. It's a special case. I'm worried that the um, hostility against police unions is going to tarnish the name of unions in general because I know these kinds of of situation, uh, I know these kinds of debates can can be, can become simplified, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I have no sympathy for for uh, police un the way that police unions have, have um, protected their members from uh, from accountability for uh, police brutality. Um, from Cortina, uh, I have heard the shift from firm based to industry based unions was critical for labor. What are the similar ways to cut data unions, pros and cons of each? Um, this, is, uh, this is another interesting question. I think, that, I think that because collective bargaining for data uh, is currently basically impossible, and in my view requires um, erecting a new legislative framework to sort of see it in action, I think we kind of don't know the answer to the question. Um, so that, like, uh, I guess the, the analog to uh, firm-based negotiation versus industry-based negotiation might track a number of other distinctions in the context of, of data, data union negotiation. You, you might imagine the customers of a particular company forming a union, or you might imagine people whose uh, data overlaps in some particular way form a union or, or uh, even even sort of like social clusters form a un forming unions, which, which, you know, is maybe a little more worrisome, a little more problematic. There's a lot of stuff to sort through. I don't think we know where the, um, uh, where the cut should be in terms of negotiating for, uh, for data. 
and we need to uh, we need to put in place new rules that um, that make it possible to to start getting information about about where those cuts uh, should and, and and shouldn't be. And um, to be clear, I think it's like an it's it's going to turn out to be an immensely complicated question, and um, I, I I think involving the sort of distributed intelligence of, uh, of many um, uh, data laborers to figure out where their common interests lie um, is the, uh, the, the beginning of, of finding the answer to that question. And uh, I'm at time, uh, so uh, thanks a lot.